love that we're joining the heavens tonight, amen, <laughs> and seeking his face. What we do here is a heavenly thing. And I'm so excited for this next term. I believe it's a new level of what we have been talking about, revealing Jesus. You know, it's so significant. We need to know the times and the seasons of the Lord, don't we? We have to be like the men of Issachar, which Issachar means reward. The reward of knowing the times and seasons is the Lord himself. He is our reward. Amen. And it's by no chance that right now, this weekend, we're celebrating Anzac Day. And again, it wasn't planned to start up this term on the week that we commemorate the legacy of this nation. And it's quite significant that we've just opened up a travel bubble with New Zealand. There is such a camaraderie and a brotherhood there, isn't there? There's something prophetic about that. That we are commemorating this weekend, this Sunday, and I encourage you wherever you're fellowshipping this Sunday, remember Anzac Day. God, his spirit over this nation is a nation or a spirit of sacrifice for love. This same courageous spirit that was on the Anzacs, I believe, is available to the church of this nation. And I love the slogan for this year's Anzac Day. You'll see it all over the news. It says, light up the dawn. Light up the dawn. It sounds almost like in Psalms where it says, awaken the dawn. Are you ready to light up the dawn this term? <laughs> and every term, amen? This is what Tuesday nights are about. It's about the morning star arising in hearts. Christ himself, the dawn, the sun, S-U-N of righteousness. I believe that he's speaking to us. He's encouraging us as we launch into a new term, a new season of delving deep in his word, that he's going to light up the dawn in hearts. But he is preparing those who are really serious about giving their lives. Because the recruitment of the Lord requires one thing. You've got to give your life. And there is a pruning. There are ones that are not willing. And that's just the way it is. But he wants to awaken the dawn, amen? You know, in the Old Testament, when they were preparing for war, they would cull down the army. Why? Because those who had fear we're not allowed to get on the front line. We're not allowed to be recruited for the war. I want to tell you that the fear of man will keep you from being used as a weapon, from victory, from bringing victory to a nation. Those Anzacs gave their lives for a people they did not even know, did not even meet face to face. But the love that was in them, the service, the willingness, was the Anzac spirit. And I believe the Lord is encouraging us today. You need to leave fear of man at the door. You know, when I first was commissioned by the Lord, He called me to be a vessel for him, he said, you're going to have to leave fear of man at the door. <laughs> you're going to have to give up your need to be liked. And right here on week one, I hear the cry of the Lord going forth saying, have you come to that place, dear one, where you have given it all up? And I know this is just the first week, but we've got to start at the beginning. <laughs> Amen. 
We've got to start with the true gospel. You cannot be part of the Lord's army. You cannot be part of his church unless you have given, you are willing to give your life. And you must leave fear of man at the door. So that is the call, that is the cry. That is why there are few. But God doesn't need masses, amen? He used 12. Who when he preached a hard word in John 6, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, and people were offended and left. Disciples that had been with him for many years had been there shoulder to shoulder with him, left, and only 12 remained. They were the ones willing to give their lives, and ultimately they did. So I hear the call. I hear the clarion call tonight, the Anzac call, Australia, church, true church of Australia. It's time to lay down your life. This is a war. And we have an enemy. You know, in the war, I'm not even in the notes, I'm just following the Holy Spirit right now. Is that okay? You know, in times of war, the Israelites would hold up a banner. Do you remember reading about that? Do you remember the story of the revelation Moses had? The Lord is my banner. Now, the banner was something that was raised up. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. It declared something. It declared the name of the Lord. And when it was raised up in war, people would rally around it. I know that we love um, demonstrations. We are a democratic country here, right? People have the right to... Um, take to the streets and demonstrate. We've seen Black Lives Matter. We've seen um, women's rights. We've seen all sorts of demonstrations happen. And you know what they hold? Banners. And some of them are really powerful. You know, some of them in the George Floyd demonstrations. I can't breathe. And you would read them and it would incite something in you of there must be justice. It would rally a crowd. It would incite this fervor, this passion of the cause. I want to tell you that when we proclaim who Christ is, and that is what we're doing here in this unit, we are proclaiming the name. We are lifting up the banner. We are declaring victory over the enemy. We are taking ground. We are getting on the front line because... I can tell you, even from the first term, declaring who Christ is, there was immense opposition. That's a good sign. Why? Because declaring who Christ is, is declaring war. And God is looking for an Anzac spirit army who are willing to lay down their lives, their reputations, their need to be liked, to raise up a banner. I'm going to talk more of that in coming weeks, but I want to tell you that what we do here on a Tuesday night isn't something glib, isn't something haphazard. This is vital. The question that Jesus asked of his apostle Who do you say I am? Was not just a a whimsical thought in the Lord Jesus' mind. He purposefully asked the apostle, Who do you say I am? Why? Because he knew the opposition that was to come. He knew the call of the apostolic And he was saying to Peter, his apostle, you need to know that you know that you know. You need to be willing to live and die for this. He was preparing him for war. 
And in it is the victory. And we're going to look at this aspect tonight of the sevenfold spirits of God. And I wish I had seven weeks to go on the sevenfold spirits of God. We could do that. But this term, the Lord really put on my heart that the, the books of the Bible that we need to dwell in are Isaiah and the smaller letters of John, 1, 2, and 3 John. So you're going to find in your readings that we'll be reading through the whole book of Isaiah. And those three smaller letters, we've just read through John, the gospel. He also wrote Revelation. We'll be going there at times. But I think often neglected are these smaller books that John wrote, these letters that are profound. <laughs> the apostle prophet were the school of apostolic and prophetic, right? The true church is built on the apostles and the prophets, Ephesians 2.20. The apostle and prophet John lays out his heart bare in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And you'll read as you read these small but powerful books, there is God is love. God is holy. And it is explicit. It is unapologetic. If you continue to sin, you have neither seen God nor known God. He, it, he doesn't mince words. This is the true prophetic voice. God is love. But you cannot have love without holiness. Love equals holiness. And so we're going to dispel some myths about love tonight. We're going to come back to see what the Word of God says. And we're going to see who the spirit of love is and the spirit of judgment. So I pray that you're going to enjoy dwelling in these books. Isaiah, let's turn to the book of Isaiah tonight. Thank you, Lord. Father, Come and speak to our hearts tonight. May we never be the same. Change us from the inside out. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We receive your truth tonight. In your mighty name, amen. amen. I'm so excited about coming to the book of Isaiah. Why? This is a man who encountered God. This is a prophet of the Lord who had such a profound encounter. We know of Isaiah 6. We're going to go there in a second. He had such a revelation of Christ. This is a man who lived 700 years before Jesus came in the flesh. And yet when you turn to the back of your notes, you're going to see a myriad of prophecies so specific, so accurate of the one Messiah. Look in Isaiah 53, was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. There is no other prophet that I can see in the Bible that had so many and so accurate 700 years before Christ came. It's phenomenal. This man was someone who knew God. And that's why I'm so excited about this book, in dwelling in this book. In it is dripping the riches of the knowledge and the revelation of Christ. And it is by the Spirit. You know, they didn't, he didn't even rub shoulders with the Lord Jesus like the disciples did. He had to receive everything by the Spirit. Can you imagine the faith that had to come by that? For that to happen. He received by the Spirit of God this incredible level of revelation of Christ himself, of a Messiah who was yet to come for hundreds of years. 
And I don't know if he even understood all of what he was writing down, but he wrote it. And today, even now, we are in awe. Isaiah the prophet, do you know his name? Means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. And yet you read from Isaiah 1 to 66 that his ministry was not to the outside world. It was to the church. Yahweh is salvation. Why? Because the gospel, some of you have heard me say this, you know it by rote, the gospel is not for just the world. The gospel is first for the church. John 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, a teacher of the law, in ministry, you need to be born again. He's speaking to the church. This is the shock or voice of the Lord. You know, a true prophetic apostolic generation. The definition, real simple, of the true prophetic is we hear the voice. Whether it is something we want to hear or not, that's the key. And often it is not what we want to hear. And that's how I know it's the Lord. That is the true prophetic. Isaiah the prophet was called to the people of God to preach the gospel, to bring a people back to the Lord. And we see in Isaiah 6, we're going to go there in a second. I'm, I'm getting you ready, friends, because there's an explosion of the revelation of who Christ is in this book. But you will see as you read through that while Isaiah had this supernatural, phenomenal encounter, revelation of who Christ is, with that came an absolute disgust at what is not the Lord. These people draw near to me and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. There was an absolute grieving that came from that encounter with the Holy One. This is the true prophetic. There will be a pulling at your heart, a vexing of your soul, like it says of Lot, at what is not the Lord. And it will be a ministry to the church first and foremost to preach the gospel. The gospel is Christ himself with a capital G. Romans 1 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Christ. For it is the power of God. That's not just signs, wonders and miracles. We know that, amen. That is the power of God to overcome, the power to know him, the power to walk holy in victory. For in it, a righteousness from God is revealed, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So the gospel must be preached, who Christ is to the church. And this is the true prophetic ministry. Yahweh is Salvation. God is taking us to a new level. Here we have in our notes, to the very throne room, to a place of the unwavering, unadulterated, pure and full revelation of Christ as he is. A truly apostolic and prophetic generation is one that sees as God sees. And you'll see this in the book of Isaiah. He sees as God sees. I want to tell you, for most who uh, have a true prophetic call, most of what you see, you really don't want to see. You, 
you wish it was not so. You don't want to see Christ walking out the door because he is not there. But you will see things as God sees. And it is to pray. This is the walk. This is the burden that comes with being a prophetic people. Isaiah the prophet knew the Lord. Hundreds of years before Christ came to the earth, Isaiah encountered the Lord in a way that would change him forever and prophesied to an incredible depth of insight, the revelation of Christ as he is. We discover as we read the book of Isaiah that with the responsibility of this profound encounter and revelation of the one also came a disgust and utter grieving over what was not the Lord in the then known church, God's people. Isaiah spoke of true revival and dreamt of a true revival generation, an apostolic and prophetic army that is the true church, for God's true church is built on the apostles and prophets. Any structure or man-made ministry must be found out for what it is, a counterfeit. Burning heart concept, a true revival generation, the apostolic and prophetic, is one that embraces not only the strokes, but the slaps from God. His comfort and his correction, they realize that the love of a father warns and corrects so that we may know him. Hebrews 12.4 we see this in the apostles' revival preaching in Acts, cutting to the heart. The very core of what it is to be truly prophetic is to hear God's voice even when it is one of correction that we don't want to hear. Acts 2, 36 to 38, Therefore let all Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, is that confronting? The message wasn't, come to Jesus and he will give you the desires and the dreams that you want. You will be prosperous and you'll travel the world and you have lots of friends and a worldwide ministry. What was the revival message? It was confronting. You crucified him. Repent and be baptised. The times of refreshing would come. This is the revival message. It cuts to the heart. I want to tell you, we need to change the culture of the church. I can't tell you how many times I've had to talk to people after messages the Lord has given us. And they say, I just don't like the way that you say it. But what is it that we're saying that's not biblical? Oh, no, no, no. I just don't like the way you say it. Have you read the verse from Jeremiah? Is not my word like fire? Like a hammer that breaks, pulverizes the rock to pieces? Friend, I don't think you know God. Now that's a brazen statement. But we are people of truth, are we not? I can tell you that I can tell from five to ten minutes of speaking with someone who says they're a Christian, whether they have encountered the spirit of the fear of the Lord. There is a difference. There is a brokenness <laughs> over sin. There is a quickness of repentance. <laughs> there is a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. <laughs> so when someone comes to me and says, I don't like the way that you said that, I know that they don't know God. Honestly, they don't want to. 
they have a Jesus of their own making. So let's turn to Isaiah 6. Let's take a close look. We know this story, but friends, there is so much richness in this profound encounter. This is the beginning of Isaiah's ministry. Now, it has been asked of us, you know, why, why do you talk about the emphasis on evangelism in the church being not a good thing? I'm not saying not to evangelize. What I'm saying is, A, has God sent you? And if he has, like you see here in Isaiah, you will be bringing people to a holy God. I want to tell you, when you send someone out to evangelize, you're sending them out on the front line. So when someone just gets saved and they're a baby in the Lord and they're growing in the knowledge of the Lord, yes, God will use them. They may share the gospel with their friends and God's changed my life. But you get them out on the streets and say, you need to evangelize every day. You need to bring 10 people to the Lord and you need to bring... They're growing in the knowledge of God. They don't know him enough to bring people really to who God is. And one comment was, well, what about the Great Commission? Go. Well, when did Jesus say that? After three years of discipleship, 24-7 with 12 men who were willing to give their lives. (laughs) Then they were ready. And then it said of them, they knew that they had been with Jesus. And yet we get people saying, we say, Get out there and evangelize. They don't even know what to do. (laughs) They don't even know who they're bringing them to. Be careful you're not doing something and bringing them into a religious act and never bringing them to a person. Yes. He still told them to wait for the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. And yet we have to go right now. We have to send ourselves. We have to do something for Jesus because it makes me feel good. I'm doing something for Jesus. All he wants from you is obedience, is to follow him. So here, Isaiah 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. There's a kingship. High and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. We just sang, holy, holy, holy. Praise God. This was Isaiah's encounter of who God is. And verse 4, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Verse 5, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Now there's a revelation, us. 
the Trinity right there. Just one word, us, was this profound revelation of who God is, the three part, the Trinity. Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Hallelujah. So much richness, so much symbolism. I've preached on aspects of this passage before, but tonight I want to dwell on one aspect. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You cannot be commissioned by the Lord. You cannot be sent from the throne room of the Lord without this kind of revelation of a holy God. And we can talk about it tonight, but I want to encourage you right from week one, right at the beginning, seek the Lord. (laughs) Have a desire like Isaiah did for this kind of encounter. (laughs) A holy God. Holy, holy, holy is what the angels cry day and night, night and day. Holy, holy, holy. We cannot say the word holy enough. We cannot say the name holy, who he is. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You may need to confess it till it gets deep into your spirit. He is holy. And from that is this revelation of the sinfulness of his own sin. Woe is me. And it just explodes and annihilates this false doctrine that if you're God conscious, you can't be sin conscious. Baloney. (laughs) Right there. Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. A deep conviction of the sinfulness of sin. This man knew God. (laughs) He had encountered the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And only then could he begin ministry, (laughs) be commissioned by the Lord, not by himself. By the Lord. We must come to this place. (laughs) I can tell you when I first got born again, I would weep for days. (laughs) Not, Not sorrow and depression or anxiety. It was over the fact that I had lived my own life and called it ministry and Christianity. And I grieved the Lord. And I would pray and I would weep. I had a revelation finally of the holiness of God. You see, the gospel is not just a mental ascent. When I was 12 years old, and and I believe I was sincere, I remember the teacher, the Sunday school teacher saying, do you want to go to heaven? Everybody put their hand up. I want to go to heaven. And I had simple faith. I believe God honored that as a 12-year-old. And they prayed the sinner's prayer, but nobody told me anything had to change. I just lived my own life. Went to church, never heard a real gospel preached. But on that day at revival, (laughs) when I heard Christ proclaimed the gospel preached, I had to give up everything. I encountered a holy God. 
I experienced the fear of the Lord. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. That is the message of revival, friends. Have we lost it? That was a revelation of an angry God. Angry at sin. And it even says that he hates the sinner. Can we receive that? Oh, I don't like the way you say that. What scripture, friend? You're not rejecting me, you're rejecting Christ. So it's water off the duck's back for me. It doesn't matter what you think of me. What I'm concerned with is do you know Christ? Will you make it to the end, friend? Do you know him? And here in Isaiah 6, we see verse 1. High and exalted was the Lord, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The smoke filled the temple. This was a symbol of his glory. I want to tell you that what has been mostly portrayed in the Pentecostal, so-called Pentecostal church, we talk about the glory, we talk about the miraculous, we talk about the signs, the wonders, and those are part and parcel of, of the Lord. But here we see that his robe, his glory fills the temple. And it is glorious. It is beautiful. It is awesome. We need it. But there is something more. See, that's just his robe. The important thing that makes that robe beautiful and grand and spectacular and awesome is the person wearing it. Is the king. See, as I was seeing a revelation that you can get so caught up in the robe and signs, wonders and miracles and the glorious and feeling the presence and never press into knowing him, the person. See, Esther got it. Esther knew the king. Esther is a picture of the bride, the real church. And she was intimate with the king. She knew him and loved him for who he is. He is intimate, a husband, but he is also fearsome. The king could execute anyone, take a life at any moment with a blink of an eye. As a whim of his day, he had the power and the authority to do so. He was a fearsome man. But Esther loved him as he was, took him as he is, loved him as a person. I want to tell you that God is looking for a people who will press past the robe. Imagine a, a wedding and the, the bride. You know, everyone goes to the wedding to see the wedding dress and what she's going to wear. And it is glorious. It is beautiful. Everyone's talking about it. But, you know, the groom isn't looking at the wedding dress. I think he would marry her if she was wearing a garbage bag. You know, he's looking for the person. That's the one he loves. That's the one he's been waiting for. That's the one he's betrothed to and enraptured with. This is a level of intimacy. This is the call of the true revival, true prophetic, apostolic generation. This was, was what Isaiah was exhorting. This is where we must come to. Some key Isaiah verses. Isaiah 29, 13. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honour me with their lips, 
but have removed their hearts far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men, mere human rules that have been taught. Doesn't that speak of men's culture? Rules and things that men have taught but their hearts are far from me. I want to tell you the true prophet Isaiah did not see with the natural eye, but saw as God sees. And often it's not something you want to see, but it is truth. Isaiah 5, 12 to 13. Amplified classic. They do not regard the deeds of the Lord, neither do they consider the operation of his hands in mercy and judgment. Therefore, my people go into captivity to their enemies without knowing it. And because they have no knowledge of God. I love the Amplified Classic here. It says they have not considered the deeds of the Lord in mercy and judgment. You know that if you're talking with someone about COVID-19 and you take them through scripture after scripture of who the Lord is, he is the judge. But they still refuse to admit, to concede that COVID-19 is a judgment from God. You don't know God. I love how God has made it so clear Now, who is the church and who is not? And I'm going to show you more clearly through this lampstand, which is a picture of the church, how clear that really is. Do you know that there have been three million deaths worldwide now through COVID-19? You think about how big that number is. Three million. Now, we're really shielded here in Australia. We're blessed. But in nations around the world, they're still raging with graves being dug, mass graves. Brazil now is the capital of COVID. It has the record for the most deaths now from COVID-19. And did you know Brazil is the capital of the Mardi Gras. That is where Mardi Gras began. It is the biggest Mardi Gras in the world. Second is New Orleans. And I've spoken on that. Is God not speaking? Do you remember the AIDS epidemic? Do you remember that? This is not a first. God has been speaking for many, many years. Now, I was watching a documentary about AIDS, and you cannot deny, even the world knows, AIDS came from the gay community. Come on. How much more clearer can God speak? (laughs) It began in the gay community. Young gay men were suddenly falling sick, dying, dropping like flies because of their sexual act. God was putting his finger. He was revealing himself as judge. This is not new, friends. Noah and the ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, Ananias and Sapphira. How many instances of scripture do we need to bring to light that God is judge? And then it moved from the gay community to those who were sharing Remember, needles as drug addicts. Is God not speaking and judging? And we began to see public toilets filled with places you could get rid of your drug-filled needles because of AIDS. To share bodily fluids was how it was transmitted. Is God not ingenious? And so there was a fear amongst the drug addict community, a fear amongst the gay community. This idea of a judgment through plague is not new. 
We just have to hear God's voice in it. We just have to discern and understand this is from the Lord. And yet they will not listen. Even the church will not listen. I want to tell you, 99% of who calls themselves the church, when I say to them COVID is from the Lord, they look at me like I am an alien. Why? Because they have not encountered holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And woe is me. Woe is the people. I want to tell you this revelation of Christ and who he is. You're going to have to hang on to it for dear life. These are the last days. I'm going to share with you, and I think this is the right time. Last term, we went through the book of Job. Did everyone enjoy going deep into the book of Job? Well, as I was meditating on Job for that term, at the end of that season, I looked up and there was Job standing in front of me. And I asked him, I've been dying to ask him this. I asked him, how did you make it through? How, how did you get through all that? All that suffering, all that trial. How did you remain with the Lord? How did you come out victorious? It must have been supernatural. What was, your, what was the key? And he said two words to me. And then vanished. And the two words were, stay true. Stay true. And I wept. (laughs) Two words that can change your life. And he was preparing me for things that were to come. There was an intensity of opposition that was coming my way. And he was preparing and training me. You know, this one thing to have Bible college, and I love these nights, but it's another for the Lord to send his saints and prophets to train us. (laughs) They've been through it. (laughs) Usually they come to empower us, to train us. I want to tell you that the opposition to come is only going to intensify. The rejection of the Lord to come is only going to get stronger. And he's calling you to the front line. But the only thing that will keep you is to stay true. And you see that throughout the book of Job. He just keeps proclaiming who the Lord is in the face of so-called friends who just misunderstand, bring what is not truth. And he just keeps proclaiming who Christ is. He keeps true to the Lord. Truth is what will keep you. Isaiah 5, verse 24. Therefore his tongues of fire lick up straw or shaft, New King James, or stubble, NASB. And as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. And this is an interesting verse. I love how it talks about tongues of fire. Where else in scripture do we read about tongues of fire? Acts 2. two. And I want to bring out something here about tongues of fire. And Pentecostals love this, this subject, don't we? We love the tongues of fire and spirit came and rested on them like tongues of fire. But I want to tell you that that wasn't just about working miracles and having the power to do signs, wonders and miracles. The disciples were doing that already, weren't they? 
But here I believe was, and we hear, here we read it in this verse in Isaiah. Here we see, I believe, in Acts 2, a commissioning from the Lord. See, those tongues of fire, it says in Isaiah 5.24, licked up the straw, the shaft, the stubble. What is the straw, the shaft, the stubble? What is the wood, hay, stubble? It is false ministry. It will be burnt up, it says in Corinthians. See, when that tongues of fire, the Spirit of the Lord came upon the apostles, the disciples, it burnt up in them, I believe, spiritually, everything that was the works of man. It was a commissioning of purifying from the Lord of the fire of God that you cannot do this in man's strength, that the commissioning of the true apostolic that I am bestowing on you, the birth of this revival church is built on the fire that burns up everything that is wood, hay and stubble, that is man-made, that is man's way, that is built up man's kingdom. This is the apostolic commissioning. To operate in God's spirit of fire was to bring a destruction to religion, man's work and man-centered building. So now we come to Isaiah 11. Let's turn there. And I want to talk. I want us to bring us to this profound area. I want you to spend some time this week meditating on the seven spirits of God. Or in some renditions, the sevenfold spirits of God. Now, there are multiple scriptures here. Maybe we can read them out. Maybe one by, I can give out a scripture to different people. We can read it out. Revelation 1, 4. Um, Narelle, could you read that one out? Um, Revelation 3, 1, Janet. Revelation 4, 5. Um, John, can you read that one? Revelation 5, 6. Um, Claudette. Revelation, oh, sorry. Uh, Exodus 25, 31, um, Andrew, and Zechariah 4, 2. Um, maybe Israel, you can read that one last. Awesome. So Revelation 1, 4. Yeah. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Good. Revelation 3 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Revelation 4 5. Out of mm -hmm. the throne came flashes of lightning. Rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven blazing torches burn with the seven spirits of God, the seven twelve Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Seven eyes as well. Interesting, which is a symbol of the prophet. Awesome. Exodus. Exodus 25, 31. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stems, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. Yes. Amen. Zechariah. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a gold, a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it. The 
the seven channels to the lights. Yes. So we see multiple prophets talking about this all-important revelation of Christ, the sevenfold spirit. We're going to seal her here for a moment. Seven. What is the number seven? Perfection. Perfection. I believe three is completion. We're going to come to that in a moment. But after reading those scriptures, let's now come to Isaiah 11. 11 is the number of the prophet. <laughs> Amen. So this is a key, key passage, Isaiah 11. And here, straight away, we see a profound revelation and prophecy of Christ himself. Verse 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Right there, he prophesies, Jesus will come. The Messiah will come from the lineage of Jesse, from yeah, ultimately King David. Amen? How accurate. And from his roots, a branch with a capital B will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And then it explains who the spirit of the Lord is. The spirit of wisdom and, everyone say and. Now this is important. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not, I love this, he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what, by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, faithfulness the sash around his waist. This is not an incredible revelation. Isaiah, 700 years before Christ came. Now here we see, and I know that there have been some renditions at times of these being separate things, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. People have said those are two spirits. But why is has this been rendered in this passage as and. They're joined together, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. They go together. What's the next one? The spirit of counsel and of might. In some renditions, it's strength, counsel, and strength. What's the next one? Very important. The spirit of knowledge, knowledge yeah, and, again, they go together, the fear of the Lord. Now, these are the seven spirits of God. The seven lamps of the golden lampstand. Here we see Isaiah revealing three of them, I believe. There are more to come. But let's talk about these ones first. Wisdom and understanding. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Understanding in the Hebrew also means discernment. Spirit of wisdom and discernment. This is the Spirit of the Lord. This is Christ. The Spirit of counsel and might. Now I want to tell you that there is God's counsel and there is man's counsel. I can't tell you how many times I have chatted with someone who has opposed me because they said, well, I, I've done a counselling degree. 
and you shouldn't say it like that. <laughs> in the church, I did my counselling degree and I'm in inner healing ministry and you just don't understand. See, you need to find out what they went through. You need to let them share their hearts. And there is a place of, of counselling, but it is God's counsel, amen? What I find is the devil in the church now is this humanistic counselling root that has taken the place of God's counsel. It is man's soulish technique. They give you techniques and they give you a means, I find, to make an excuse for sin. Oh, but I never had a mother. You're not being mothering to me. But the Lord says to forgive. But you don't understand. I, I never understood. I never learnt that from a mother. I had a father who abused me. Maybe. But I want to tell you, abuse is never an excuse for sin. Christ hung on a cross, whipped, tortured, went through horrific abuse. And did not sin. So who are you to say, but I was abused, but I went through trauma. But, and those things, God can heal you. God cares for you. But it is not an excuse for sin. See, the counsellor in the book of John is spoken together with the spirit of truth. They shall know the Truth. The truth is Christ. The secret is knowing Christ. Christ is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So you hang on to that sin and make excuses for it, you will not know freedom. You're just massaging their soul. They'll go round the mountain. They'll feel good for a couple of days and they'll relapse into unforgiveness, offence, whatever their besetting sin is. And nobody has the courage to bring the spirit of truth that says, if you do not forgive, he will not forgive you. That will set you free. That's the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That's the spirit of counsel and of might. <laughs> Who will have the bravery to bring Jesus? Throw out the worldly counselling. Throw out your counselling degree. I find that the ones who lean on that the most have the strongest devils. <laughs> they will not come to truth. The spirit of counsel and might. And here we find, I love this. Have you met the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord? The two go together. The and is important. Now, here's the thing. You cannot know God unless you have a revelation of the fear of the Lord. I don't believe you can be saved unless you've met the fear of the Lord. Because you need to know you are a sinner that needs desperate saving. <laughs> That's the fear of the Lord. That without him, I am destined for eternity in hell. I deserve it. My wages of sin is death. The fear of God came on me that day I was born again. And I realized I'm not saved I've been doing things for Jesus my whole life and I'm not saved. I've been living my own life and the light came on and the spirit of the fear of the Lord came and I ran to the front and repented of every sin I could think of. The biggest one of all was I, living, I was living my own life and it was putrid before the Lord. It was religion. I was doing things for him and I was deceived the spirit of knowledge 
and the fear of the Lord invaded my heart and I was saved. I was a Nicodemus who needed to be born again. Do you know the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord? I've spoken already. I can tell when someone knows the fear of the Lord. You can meet him today. That's the good news. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Now the rest here is also found in Scripture. The remaining four spirits of the sevenfold spirit of God, which I believe as revealed in a vision when I was here last term. I saw the remaining three. And I saw the spirit of judgment. The spirit of truth and the spirit of love. Now turn to Isaiah 4, verse 4, and you'll find the remaining one there. Isaiah 4, verse 4. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment, which we have up there, and a spirit of burning. burning. Or a spirit of fire. Now, in the Amplified Classic, it adds a spirit of fire and sifting. Spirit of fire and sifting. And when I had this vision of the golden lampstand, all I saw were these three here. that were yet to be lit in fullness. And these three were key to the last day's church. You will see what is the true church, the definition, the confirmation that it is God's church will be these three in particular burning with passion together. Spirit of judgment, spirit of truth, Spirit of love, all together. And the seven together, can you imagine the beauty and the glory of that golden lampstand reflecting off the gold of the holy place, revealing the bread of presence, revealing the altar of incense, revealing everything that spoke of Jesus in the fullness of seven Lamps fully lit, and they were to be lit day and night. There was a relentlessness of burning constantly of these seven spirits of God, these seven revelations of the perfection of who God is. And that is why, you know, in Psalm 119, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The lampstand is the word, but also in Revelation 1.20, it says the lampstand is the church. There were seven lampstands who were the seven churches. So let's look at that all together. If you are in a meeting under a ministry and these are not burning, it is not the church. Hello. Remember how he said to the church of Ephesus, I'm about to remove your lampstand. Why? Because you're not burning. You've left your first love. I'm about to remove it. Now all you are is a social club. Talks about Jesus and builds your own man's ministry and man's kingdom. 
So you can start off well and then something goes out. People don't talk about the fear of the Lord. People don't repent quickly. There isn't a preaching of the sinfulness of sin and the holiness of God. If the fear of the Lord is not there, it is not the church. Can I make that clearer? (laughs) The lamp is the church. I love the sevenfold spirits of the Lord. Now, spirit of fire is not my word like fire, like a hammer that breaks. We spoke that before. Spirit of judgment, he is our judge. The spirit of truth, John 16, 13, John 14, 17, John 15, 26, 1 John 4, 6, 1 John 5, 6. John was really into truth, (laughs) if you don't notice. He had a revelation of the spirit of truth. You can go into those scriptures in your own time. I encourage you to meditate on them. But the spirit of truth is one of the sevenfold spirits. And I want to end on this, the spirit of love. People tell me I don't talk about love enough. Well, I'm going to talk about love. (laughs) But I'm going to talk about what scripture says about love. Is that okay? 1 John 5, 2. This is how we know that we love. You want to know how we love? This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. I love how John just makes it really clear. (laughs) There's no mincing words. If you don't follow his commands, you don't love. It's really simple. 1 John, let's just go to 1 John 3, 6. One of my faves. Holiness equals love. Let's just read from verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. We're going to go into future weeks and what it is to be really in Christ. (laughs) I'm looking forward to that. Are you looking forward to that? There's so much scripture on it and I'm looking forward to going deep in it. But here we read, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. It's very clear. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. So the word continues is key. I'm not talking about condemnation. I'm not talking about, you know, you went over the speed limit and I'm unsaved, I'm unsaved. That's not what the scripture is about. It's talking about continuing to sin, that you're content with that, you're okay with that. You're not quick to repent. You haven't encountered the spirit of the fear of the Lord. You don't know him. That is what John was talking about. If that's the case... That says to me, you have neither seen him nor known him. You don't know him. I love how explicit John is, but you can. You can repent today. You can cry out, Lord, I want to know the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And here... 1 John, sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Love does not delight in evil. Comes after love is long-suffering, patient, love is kind. Does not envy, does not boast. Does not insist on itself in some versions it says. 
And it goes on to say, love does not delight in evil, injustice and unrighteousness, Amplified Classic, but rejoices with the truth. Amplified Classic says, rejoices when right and truth prevail. That's love. So I find when people come to me and they say, but you don't talk enough about love. Well, yes, I do. Because I talk about truth. That's love. I talk about holiness. That's love. I talk about obeying God's commands. That's love. See, your problem is that you don't know what love is. Truth bomb. <laughs> you think it's a feeling. You think it's me going, oh, you poor thing. Oh, you never had a mother. Oh, you poor thing, you went through that. And there are times that God comforts and he cares for us. But then he brings truth to set us free. Right? That's love. When right and truth prevail. Thank you, Father.